Hello everyone, welcome back to AS and A Level Biology with Dr. Demi. I am Dr. Demi and in today's video I am going to continue with homeostasis. If you haven't watched the very first video which is the introduction to homeostasis and thermoregulation, I suggest that you start there mostly because this chapter can be a bit challenging for students because it has a lot of detail and it's just a nice idea for you to ease yourself in. So please make sure you check that out first and then you can come to this one where we discuss the um, ultrafiltration and how the body makes pee and how that leads to the regulation of water potential in the body. Now this section is quite long, this part of homeostasis is quite long so I have split it into two videos and you will see um, right after this one please make sure you check out the following one so that you get the complete picture of what is happening. Um, and also something else I need to point out to you is that I am using the playlists function on YouTube to organize the videos so that if you only want to study a specific chapter or revise for it or whatever it is that you wish to do, you can just go to the playlist and select that chapter. All of the videos for that chapter are under the playlist, except for chapter nine, which has just one video. So all you have to do with chapter nine is just set it out on the channel. All right, that's done. Let's get into this very long yet very interesting section of homeostasis. So when we speak about the um, water potential in the body, concentration of water and all of that, um, that is not the only thing that is regulated. We also regulate the amount of proteins um, that are in the body, but that doesn't work through the kidneys. So we start by doing that with the process of deamination. With deamination, what simply happens is that we eat a lot of proteins and when those proteins can't be stored in the body, um, they also can't just be thrown out as excretion because they can provide valuable sources of, they can become valuable sources of energy. So what happens in that case is that deamination is used to remove amine groups from the amino acid in order to store them as keto acids. If that did not make any sense to you, don't stress too much about it. I am going to explain it on the next slide. All right, so let's start with deamination first of all. And usually this is just an introductory section that might seem a bit disjointed to what it is we're about to discuss. Uh, but it's just important for you to know this, that when you consume excess proteins in your body, your body doesn't get rid of those excess proteins. Instead, it converts them into usable sources of energy. So this is what the structure of an amino acid typically would look like. Um, well, that's not a perfect structure, uh, but usually when I tell students, and if you haven't watched the um, videos on biological molecules, please make sure you do so. But this is what the structure of an amino acid is here, um, which I am drawing with my red pen over here so just doing that so that you're able to see all right this is what an amino acid um, structure is and we said when we did chapter two that the r group here is a variable group it's called the side group this is the carboxyl um, carboxylic acid group and this is the amine group so just like this process suggests the deamination what it simply means is that we are removing the amine group um, from this amino acid over here so you can see when you look there the amine group is removed and a hydrogen is also um, removed and added to that amine group in order to make ammonia. Ammonia is then processed in the liver because ammonia is a highly toxic compound. So it is processed in the liver and then converted to urea, um, which is then um, excreted out of the body. The remaining uh, section of the amino acid, which now looks something like that, is called a keto acid, or you can call it a ketone. Um, and this keto acid can be respired um, as part of respiration in order to produce energy, um, or it can be converted to glucose, or it can be converted to fat. It's all dependent on what the body needs at the time. So this is the process of deamination. 
And of course, you might think, okay, well, that makes no sense considering that we are now going into the kidney. But the point of you knowing that is so that you know that deamination is a process that happens even before things get to the kidneys, um, before they are excreted. The kidney has a very, very important function in the body. It is involved in the filtration of toxic wastes out of the body. It is involved in the filtration of salt. It is also very involved in regulating in how much water stays in your body. And this is why the kidney is really, really a key part of homeostasis. What happens with the kidney is we have blood that is carried to the kidney um, through the renal artery, and you have the renal vein that carries um, blood away from the kidney. And you also have the ureter, which is this over here. The ureter would carry um, urine from the kidney to the bladder, and the ureter would carry um, urine from the bladder outside the body. This is just introductory stuff. It's not really um, stuff that you have to know based on your syllabus, but it does give you an idea of how the kidney um, looks and what it does. So now let's zoom into the kidney. Before I even start to um, explain what these tubes are and everything, one thing I want you to know is that you usually get questions in the exam that ask you to label certain parts of the kidney. So for example, they might say, they might put a line here and call it A, and then they put another line here and they call it B. Um, so it's very important for you to know what these different parts of the kidney are. I want you to bear in mind that the very outer membrane here, this double membrane um, line over here, I hope you can see it, is called the capsule. And it's like a membrane that sort of covers the outside of the kidney. And the layer right after it is called the cortex. So this here where I have labeled as B would be considered the cortex. Then you have this um, whitish section that's here in the center. That here would be the pelvis um, of the kidney. Okay, that's the pelvis of the kidney. And before you get to the pelvis, you have another section that's on the um, outside of it, and that would be called the medulla. Um, so please just bear those in mind. You can look at the textbook because I think the textbook has a clearer image for you to look at, but try to um, learn the different parts of the kidney. With that said, something that's really key as we zoom into this section of homeostasis is what we call the nephron. The nephrons are thousands of tubes that are arranged inside of the kidney. And what they do is that they help with the filtration of the blood as well as the production of urine. So when we talk about going to pee in the dead of the night or drinking some water and frequently visiting the bathroom, the nephrons are the ones that are busy doing most of the work within the kidneys to ensure First of all, that we do not lose valuable um, ions and molecules in our urine, and we do not lose too much water um, if our water potential is low. Each nephron is, consisted, um, is set to consist of a Bowman's capsule, a glomerulus, a proximal convoluted tubule, the loop of Henle, the distal convoluted tubule, and the collecting duct. Now, I know that that just sounds like gibberish if you've never seen this before, but we do have an image that zooms in a lot better and will help you understand why these tiny tubes, thousands of them, are present in the kidney and the functions that they serve. Okay, so now let's zoom in a little bit more into what the nephron looks like. When you look at the nephron, you will see a network here, and this is in black and white. Um, usually you'd find it in red in many of the images. So you'd see this here, and it looks like a network, like a woven network of blood vessels. That is called the glomerulus. The glomerulus is a network of capillaries that simply carry blood um, and plays a role in the production of urine. The glomerulus is fed by, is fed and also sort of feeds another um, atriole. So you have the afferent atriole and the afferent atriole is the atriole that carries um, blood into the glomerulus while the efferent atriole is the atriole that carries blood away from the glomerulus. You then have what we call the Bowman's capsule. The Bowman's capsule is like a tube or like a cap, and that's this one over here. It's like a tube that sort of encloses the glomerulus, right? And that Bowman's capsule 
feeds into what we call the proximal convoluted tubule. I often tell students that if you want to remember what tubule comes first, always think of the fact that proximal, think of proximity, close to. So the very first tubule you encounter right after the Bowman's capsule is the proximal convoluted tubule. It leads down to the loop of Henle or, or Henle's loop, as it says here. And that leads then to the distal convoluted tubule. Think of distal as something that's far away. And from the distal convoluted tubule, you get to the collecting duct. Again, don't stress too much about this. All of these play a role in the formation of urine, and I have broken it down as best as I can um, to explain to you what they all do. But I'm just trying to show you here um, what the overall structure of the filtrate um, of the nephron is. I also want to draw your attention to the fact that we have something here called the direction of filtrate, but that becomes clearer as we start to go through the structure in detail. So let's get into it. How does the body make urine? So the very first thing, we've already spoken about the structure of the nephron and um, all of these things. So the very first thing we need to know is this. Here you are, I'm just going to paint a picture to you so that um, it sort of, sort of sits well in your head as you, as you listen to this. So here you are, say you've woken up in the morning, um, you have a cup of coffee, and you go to class, you have um, a couple of subjects with your teacher, and during lunchtime, you go and have a sandwich and a can of Coke, and you just carry on throughout your day. What's happening within your body as you drink your coffee, your water, your Coke, or whatever it is that you're taking, is that your body is taking all of those and filtering them through the nephrons inside your kidneys. So what happens, first of all, is all of the things that are in those things you've had, including the water, are absorbed into your blood. Once that's absorbed into the blood, remember what we said, that we have the renal artery that feeds the kidney with blood. The renal artery will carry that blood. So I drew this very um, crooked looking image, but um, it does the, the job, trust me. Um, your renal artery will carry that blood and it would feed it to the afferent atrial. That's this big atrial over here. The afferent atrial then takes the blood and it feeds it through the glomerulus. This red bit here um, that I have drawn is the glomerulus. So it feeds it through the glomerulus. But I want you to notice something that's happening here. The afferent atrial has a wide diameter compared to this one, which is the efferent atrial. Um, didn't put a label there. Um, this is the efferent atrial, the one that leads away from the nephron. Okay, this difference in diameter creates a pressure in here. So think of it like a bottleneck. It creates a pressure inside the glomerulus that then causes the things that are in the blood. All right, things that are in the blood, like your glucose, your sodium ions, your potassium ions, um, your um, some of your very small um, molecules, it creates such pressure that those molecules start to flow into the Bowman's capsule. So that's what these green arrows represent. They flow into the Bowman's capsule because of the pressure that's created as a result of the difference in diameter between these two. And this is what we call ultrafiltration which simply means that when the blood is leaving, the um, is going through the kidneys and it gets into the afferent atrial, it is filtered. This system here is working like a sieve and it's a sieve that's not based on any chemical reaction, but it's simply based on size. And that means that any molecule that is able to fit between the holes um, that are here would be able to get into the Bowman's capsule. So this here is the Bowman's capsule. All right. And something that you'd also find, and this sometimes this is a 15 mark question that students get in paper four, is that they would be asked, for example, what is it about the glomerulus and the Bowman's capsule that allows for ultrafiltration to happen? So first things first is that you need to um, say that there are cells that have gaps between them. These cells are called the podocytes. So there are tiny gaps between these cells. Um, that then allow for these small molecules that are able to fit into those holes to get in. 
into the Bowman's capsule. You also have the basement membrane. So this is the basement membrane over here, right on top of the, right beneath the glomerulus. And the basement membrane acts um, as a filter sort of itself, but it, and it prevents big molecules like proteins. So proteins are one of the largest molecules you would find in the body. And what that basement membrane does is that it prevents proteins from passing into the Bowman's capsule. But things like glucose that are small, things like sodium, ions, potassium ions would flow into the Bowman's capsule. So this is like a mechanical sieve. Think about it when you're separating molecules of different um, sizes in your home and you have a sieve, just like when you're sifting flour um, for baking. So you have like the very tiny pieces of flour would get through and then you have the ones that are like a little bit clumpy that just would not be able to make it through. So think of it in the exact same way. The small molecules would all get through irrespective of what they are, while the bigger ones would stay behind. Some of the other compounds that stay behind or cells that stay behind are the red blood cells and the white blood cells. They also don't flow into the Bowman's capsule at all. Rather, they are taken back out through the efferent, the efferent atrial and they continue to flow back into the body. So we call that process, like I said, ultrafiltration, and we call whatever gets into the Bowman's capsule the glomerular filtrate. So the glomerular filtrate would then consist of different compounds that are so small that they can't help but go through the sieve. An example of such substances, um, I've gotten this table from the textbook that I use, um, is water. So look at this, for example, concentration in the blood plasma. So that's concentration in the blood that flows through the glomerulus is 900. And after filtration, you find that all of the water gets into the Bowman's capsule. With proteins, you can see there's like a concentration of 80 over here, but very little get into the glomerular filtrate because like I said, most proteins are very large molecules and can't go through the filtration. You also have amino acids, all the amino acids in the blood get into the Bowman's capsule as glomerular filtrate. The same thing happens with glucose, the same thing happens with urea, which is formed from deamination. The same happens with uric acid. Uric acid is also formed from deamination. Um, and you also have creatine, which is formed. And then you have your inorganic ions like sodium, potassium, and chloride, um, chloride, chloride ions that also go into the filtrate. So the point of this is to say that ultrafiltration is simply the process by which blood is filtered through the glomerulus into the Bowman's capsule, carrying with it things like water, amino acids, glucose, urea, uric acid, um, and creatinine and inorganic ions. It doesn't carry proteins. That's something important for you to know. It also doesn't carry red blood cells and white blood cells. That is why your urine doesn't come out with a red color, at least if you drink um, enough water. Um, so if we, for example, were to test a person's urine and we found in it the presence of proteins, that would suggest that there is some kind of damage um, in the kidneys that need to be fixed. So that is why it's important when you go, for example, for a medical checkup, they would check, um, do a urine test on you, not only to check for blood sugar, which we will discuss later, but also to check for things like this. So some of the factors that um, affect ultrafiltration are things like water potential, like how much water is in the blood. Um, things like blood pressure, because remember I said that the reason ultrafiltration happens so well is because of the difference in diameter between the afferent atrial and the efferent atrial. So that difference in diameter creates a certain kind of pressure as the blood flows through that forces certain substances to go into the Bowman's capsule. The solute concentration is also a very important factor in ultrafiltration. I'm going to stop this video here, but I want you to know that this is a journey um, through the nephron and you will see how everything comes together as we go along in our journey to make urine. So in this process of making urine, the first thing we have done is we have taken everything in the blood, the coffee we had for breakfast, the coke you had at lunch and all of those things and we have filtered them through the glomerulus into the Bowman's capsule. And now we're going to see what happens from the Bowman's capsule down to the end of the nephron and how that then constitutes the formation of urine. Thank you for watching. Please, please don't miss out on the next video because it is a continuation of what is happening here. 
Have a good time. Goodbye.